welcome to this lecture for Abnormal Psychology. Uh, I'll be talking today about mood disorders, focusing primarily in this lecture on diagnostic criteria. So we'll cover a couple of things that are interesting criteria. First, we'll talk about um, some terminology and how to differentiate between normal mood and a clinical disturbance in mood. Uh, we'll talk about um, the criteria for different mood episodes, and then based on those mood episodes, talk about criteria for the different disorders. Depressive disorders, including major depressive disorder, disruptive mood dysregulation disorder, persistent depressive disorder, formerly um, for, referred to as dysthymia, and premenstrual, premenstrual dysphoric disorder. And then the bipolar disorders, bipolar one and two, and cyclothymia or cyclothymic disorder. Okay, some terminology. Uh, emotion as we talked about before, is a state of arousal defined by subjective states of feeling. Right? So in a period of time, usually in, a react, in reaction to some internal external events, something happens, you think about it, and then you experience some uh, physiological arousal, and you feel happy, sad, angry, embarrassed, um, whatever. That's, that's your experience of an emotion. Right? And these disorders aren't emotion disorders, they're mood disorders. So emotions are involved, but that's not going to be the focus of what we talk about. Another related concept is affect. And this is that pattern of observable behaviors, like facial expressions, that are associated with subjective feelings. So generally, um, this word is used somewhat talking about mood disorders, but we more often talk about affect um, when talking about um, psychotic disorders, like schizophrenia. Uh, because there's often some uh, impairments in affect or abnormal affect or people aren't displaying emotions in a, a consistent way. Whereas with the mood disorders, uh, if you are depressed, typically your affect is depressed. If you're manic, your affect is consistent uh, with that is manic. There's, uh, we don't have that inconsistency between uh, mood and affect with the mood disorders as we do with some other disorders. So what are we talking about mostly? We're talking about mood, right? And that's this pervasive and sustained emotional response that may affect a person's perceptions, right? And this idea that it may affect our perceptions, uh, keep in mind that this is kind of um, cyclical. Your perceptions affect your mood and your mood affects your perceptions. So if you see something and you uh, think of something in a kind of a negative way, have a negative interpretation, that tends to make you feel bad, have a negative mood state. But what we also know once you're in a negative mood state, that tends to affect your perceptions and you tend to perce perceive things more negatively. Attend more to negative inputs and discount uh, and just not notice or process positive inputs quite as much. Um, so the two mood states we'll talk about the most are depression and elation. Okay, before we get to the mood episodes, let's just talk a few things about the uh, differences between um, kind of normal variation in mood people's moods do change. Uh, you can feel happy, you can feel sad, that doesn't mean you're manic or depressed, uh, versus what we consider a clinical mood disturbance. So as I said, sadness and happiness without the other symptoms is not considered uh, clinical depression or mania. Um, in reality, there's no clear line uh, demarcating the, the two. And there's some guidelines we can talk about in terms of, oh yeah, you need to have these symptoms, but how much do you need to have those symptoms? And it's a matter of degree, and that's where clinical judgment comes in. Um, mania tends to, um, for a lot of people, seem, be, seem to be easier to um, distinguish, because um, feeling good, feeling happy when something good happens, uh, just subjectively uh, uh, looks different than when somebody is manic. The kind of level of energy involved with mania, um, although, uh, any of you have experienced, experience, experimented with uh, amphetamines, uh, cocaine, or your uh, over-the-counter caffeine, you get a little taste of what mania looks like for a brief period. But imagine if you're taking um, you know, several shots of espresso, and that feeling you have um, where you're really wired, and then stay there for a week, rather than the you know, um, 30 minutes to an hour, you know, or half-life of how much caffeine you've taken to get out of your system but staying in that state for an extended period of time. Okay, now maybe that's what many will look like, which don't typically happen just when something good happens. Um, now with sadness, I think it's a little little messier. Um, 
Does it experience negative events? You can feel depressed. Well, feeling depressed, feeling sad, is that the same thing as this kind of clinical uh, mood disturbance? It's shades of gray, right? There's no clear line saying, yep, here's the line where it is. Um, but it does seem, at least one of the indicators, when we get to symptoms in a minute, you'll see um, a lot of the symptoms, some of the symptoms, uh, are more kind of physical in terms of the changes in sleep uh, and appetite. We refer to those as the somatic or vegetative symptoms. And the presence of those seems to be more um, indicative of a clinical mood disturbance than normal sadness. Whereas, um, you know, just kind of feeling sad, even crying, those tend to be things that happen, kind of normal mood variation, and aren't necessarily uh, as indicative of depression. And again, they may be applied to criteria, but they're not, um, they're not as a, um, kind of cardinal traits when we think about it. Um, one way to think about the transition between, uh, okay, if think about these things being on a continuum where, okay, yeah, I'm kind of sad or I'm kind of happy, where does it get to depression or mania? Well, what indicates that transition? Not necessarily transition in terms of a person going from getting sad, sadder to depression, but looking at two people who are similarly sad, one has depression and one doesn't. Okay, what's the difference between those? Where's that line? Okay, well, some indicators of that line is how pervasive, pervasive the mood is across situations and over time. Right, so um, typically someone who's experiencing clinical depression uh, is going to be sad, and they'll be sad across situations. So it's not just they're you know, sad when they're sitting in a bar thinking about their ex, and then you know, they go uh, um, walk next door to an arcade, and all of a sudden they're feeling fine and happy and laughing, playing games. And although, oddly enough, that can happen with depression and you get diagnosed with a specifier of um, atypical features because that's atypical, that's kind of weird. Typically, you're sad across settings. And again, not just for a little bit, not just for a day, but for this extended period of time. And as we'll see with the mood episodes, uh, you have to have uh, generally two weeks of uh, depressive symptoms to be diagnosed with a depressive episode. And for mania, it's uh, typically a week hypomania, four days. But still, not just a day, not just two days, not a couple of days. It is an extended period of time where this mood kind of is all the time, most situations feeling this way, either depressed or, or manic. Another one is the change in mood may come out of nowhere or be disproportionate to circumstances. Right? So if something horrible happens and you feel sad, well, the change in mood didn't come out of nowhere. There's just kind of a identifiable reason you're feeling bad. Or you got this raise at work and you're feeling really good. Okay, it kind of makes sense that you're happy. Oh, this person who you're attracted to called you back. You feel really good and euphoric. Well, that's not mania. That's just living and happiness. Now, if you're you know, sitting doing a crossword puzzle and all of a sudden you get that same sense of euphoria, okay, that kind of came out of nowhere. Um, and that might be disproportionate to your circumstances. You know, uh, you finally figured out you know, three across. You probably shouldn't be feeling like you're the you know, emperor of Rome at this point. Um, so for clinical mood disturbances, again, they can, uh, they don't always come without identifiable, hey, something happened and I feel this way, but they can, right? Uh, especially uh, when for depression, the first depressive episode, typically there's identifiable, this thing happened, and then I began to feel bad. Um, but after that first episode, there seems to be this susceptibility that develops, and you may develop subsequent depressive episodes without as kind of uh, as big a stressor uh, uh, happening. And mania really can come uh, out of nowhere. Oh, there are some triggers there too. Um, but generally the mood is out of proportion to what's happening. Uh, again, you have cognitive, somatic, and behavioral symptoms, with which those somatic ones, and we're talking about in, in a little bit, being probably the, the biggest kind of red flags for, okay, yeah, this might be more than just sadness, might be more than just feeling good. And then kind of one of the really squishy gray ones is that there's this subjective experience of a different quality of the mood change where the person experiences yeah I feel really good not, not like regular good like crazy good like I'm on something okay yeah it feels different to them or when they're depressed yeah I've been sad before but this is different this feels this is hard this is something deeper so they know at some level often um, that it is out of their typical experience. Okay. What about those situations involving grief? Okay, this is where it gets uh, particularly tricky with grief and depression. Right? So you have acute grief, which 
based on um, research and theory, the general thinking is, okay, six to 12 months uh, of grieving is typical, is normative. And this is, again, there are going to be some significant cultural variability in grieving process and what grieving looks like. But in our Western bias way of looking at things, we tend to think of six to 12 months being the time you have to grieve. And when you're grieving, uh, you may have cognitive, somatic, and behavioral symptoms that overlap to some degree with a depressed episode. Not as much of the somatic, some somatic symptoms, especially early on in the first uh, month or two, uh, but the cognitive behavioral persisting on beyond that for a couple of months. Uh, and that's the same as just being, okay, yeah, you're grieving. It's not a diagnosis. And then at some point, um, if you come to accept the loss, okay, this person is gone, <sighs> I'm done with this kind of whatever your cultural, um, culturally ingrained process is for grieving, there seems to be an end point where you go, okay, yeah, it's time to move on. It's time to take off the black, time to go out again, time to put their picture back up or take it down, whatever that, there's going to be some transition where, okay, now you've achieved this integrated grief. And it's integrated grief because even though there's some kind of uh, finality to acceptance of it, there's still some symptoms, if you want to, if you want to use that term symptoms, which again implies illness, um, whereas uh, there's still some sadness when thinking about the person, especially around anniversaries or uh, significant dates related to that person, uh, some sense of uh, uh, loneliness and missing them still being there. And again, this isn't a diagnosis. This is what we think about being the normal grieving process, what's going to be really bad for a while, and then you'll get to a place where there's the shift, and you're not just, hey, I'm so glad they're dead, right? It doesn't, that doesn't seem to happen, where there's still some sadness, uh, and there's still attachment to the person uh, that's gone but you're able to, to function and not be interfered with um, by the kind of the grieving process anymore. And that's expected to happen, again, after six to 12 months. If that doesn't happen, if you don't get to that acceptance uh, stage, then uh, it may be complicated grief. And this is where you have these intense grief symptoms uh, that persist beyond six months, beyond 12 months, um, where they're feeling um, really sad, focusing a lot about the thoughts about the person, and oftentimes thoughts about their death and maybe some guilt associated with that uh, tends, to, to, tends to happen with complicated grief. Um, so in DSM-5, there was a shift from, from the previous version. In the previous version for major depressive disorder, there was a, a bereavement exclusion, right? Where you said, okay, uh, don't diagnose a depressive episode or major depressive disorder if uh, there's been a loss within this time period, certain period of time. DSM-5 took that out, took out the exclusion. Now they added back some footnotes saying, hey, but you know, be careful when diagnosing depression in the context of grief. But they took out the exclusion because the idea being that, well, some people that have a loss and are grieving can also be depressed, right? So you might just be grieving or you might be grieving and have developed a depressive episode. If you've developed a depressive episode, Okay, and that includes possibly some increased risk of suicidal ideation or, or attempts, then we need to kind of label it as such is the thinking and provide, mis and provide treatment rather than just um, letting the, the typical grief process play out if there's this danger of uh, more significant pathology. Which that is a complicated decision that was made and we'll see what happens uh, over time with the next DSM. Um, kind of both sides of the argument, some people saying, well, you're just pathologizing grief. Yeah, they're sad. It's only been three months uh, and they're not eating, but that's normal. It's normative for them. The DSM-5 Psychiatric Association now would say, yeah, but it's, it's too much, so we're going to label it. And again, labeling it doesn't mean you have to treat it, treat it, but labeling it does open up some doors for treatment that might not be open if they don't have that label, theoretically. Although in, 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 in all practicality, if someone is experiencing major depressive symptoms uh, in the context of grief and they go to their family practice doctor, um, they don't necessarily have to diagnose them with major depressive disorder to prescribe them Prozac, right? They say, hey, you seem really sad, try this pill. So uh, it's an interesting debate. Okay, the mood um, episodes. So you don't get diagnosed with an episode. 
But there are criteria for episodes because meeting criteria for different episodes determines whether or not you meet criteria for different disorders. Okay. So again, it's important to know these uh, criteria because they're basically embedded in the diagnosis uh, diagnostic categories for the disorders, but the episodes themselves aren't disorders. They aren't diagnoses. So to determine if somebody's having a major depressive episode, which can occur in major depressive disorder, can occur in bipolar disorders, um, you've got to have five or more symptoms present during a two-week period representing a change from previous functioning with at least one symptom uh, being uh, depressed mood or loss of interest in pleasure. Okay, so in this two-week period, um, so you had uh, a change from previous functioning, and typically previous functioning being uh, normal mood, euthymic mood, or it could be, yeah, I was kind of sad, but then I got this shift. So it's not this slow decline, it seems to be this shift where it drops right, for, for depression. Uh, in at least two weeks, a typical mood episode for depression uh, is closer to two months, month to two months, can be as long as uh, nine months. But for, diag for diagnostic purposes, it has to be at least two weeks of having these symptoms, these mood symptoms, where you're feeling uh, the most of the symptoms most of the day, nearly every day for this period. So again, it's not just being kind of down for a little bit, it's having a lot of symptoms for a fairly extended period of time. And at least one symptom has to be depressed mood or the uh, loss of interest or pleasure uh, in, uh, in activities, which is um, anhedonia, right? So, again, one of the top two things you can have, depressed mood most of the day, nearly every day, or diminished interest or pleasure in most activities most of the time. So you have to have one of those two, uh, at least. If you have everything else and not those two, well, something else is going on. You maybe have some uh, uh, some sort of endocrine disorder. Significant weight loss or weight gain when not trying, or a decrease or increase in appetite. Now this is interesting, right? So either you're gonna lose weight and not be hungry, or you're gonna be really hungry and you're gonna gain weight. Those seem like opposites. How can they be uh, applied to the same disorder? Good question, good question, not sure. Uh, and again, Part of it is these, these categories are, are heterogeneous. People aren't all the same in the category. It's important to realize. So it seems like the thinking is there's some sort of a disruption in the, uh, the neural mechanisms involved in uh, feeding and satiety. Right? And where that disruption goes up, eat more, or down, eat less, depends on some factors that haven't yet been identified. Similarly, you get this sleep disruption. So it's gonna interfere with eating one way or the opposite that's going to interfere with sleep one way or the opposite so insomnia where difficulty uh, falling asleep staying asleep getting quality sleep or hypersomnia where you're sleeping for extended periods of time uh, throughout the night and then napping throughout the day always kind of tired and then again you've got these opposites being paired psychomotor agitation where they're kind of fidgety and, and restless or psychomotor retardation where they're moving very kind of slowly and seem to have um, uh, low energy. And then you have fatigue or loss of energy. So we've given up our pairings for a minute. And this seems to be, I would say, more um, indicative of depression. The psychomotor agitation is a little strange. And that seems to be more if you have got some uh, a secondary anxiety disorder with your depression. Depression seems to be really about this loss of energy. So the fatigue is, is um, more likely to be present. Uh, and then diminished ability to concentrate or make decisions and recurrent thoughts of death, suicidal ideation, or suicide attempts. Um, so something to keep in mind about uh, a major depressive episode is it's not just about sadness. It doesn't really seem to be about sadness very much. It seems to be more about um, low positive affect than high negative affect, right? So it's not, oh, I'm so sad, nah, nah, and kind of big sadness. It's more of this low, yeah, I'm just, uh, I don't know, you know, sad, nothing seems good, right? It's more of, um, it to be kind of actively sad takes an energy 
that is uncharacteristic of a major depressive episode. Right? And that's more kind of a normal mood disturbance when something bad happens and you're sad about it and you're also kind of angry about it and anger is kind of energizing. People that uh, suffer from depression often don't seem to have the energy to be angry. It's just this really, like they're turning down the volume, turning down the energy. Um, like the life force, life force has been sapped away to some degree during this episode. Right? And again, it is a distinct episode. So there is this recovery where the, you turn the volume back up, the energy comes uh, back up at the end of that period to some degree. Now we can contrast that with its kind of opposite, being a manic episode. So again, this is still a distinct period uh, of, uh, of mood change, of abnormally and persistently elevated, expansive or irritable mood, uh, and abnormally and persistently increased goal-directed uh, activity or energy lasting at least one week and present most of the time. So uh, fewer symptoms uh, required, and again, partly because when somebody's manic, you can kind of say, oh yeah, they're manic, I can see that, I can see one thing, one symptom, I go, yep, that's mania. So three or more symptoms, but if your mood, instead of being kind of uh, elevated, expansive, kind of happy, yeah, lots of energy, yay, instead it's the irritable kind, you have to have uh, four symptoms, because the irritability is um, less characteristic of uh, pure mania, per se, like some people present that way, but a lot of the things have an irritability in terms of uh, irritability uh, can co-occur fairly frequently with depression, with a lot of anxiety disorders. So if that's your kind of key mood feature, you've got to have more symptoms to say, oh, okay, yeah, maybe this is mania, not just something else. So uh, inflated self-esteem, uh, grandiosity, thinking you're the best thing uh, ever, uh, decreased need for sleep, um, and this is interesting because they seem to, it's not just a decrease in perception of need for sleep. I can stay up all the time. No, they really can. They really can be fine with uh, three, four hours a night uh, and not seem tired and sluggish the next day. Uh, being more talkative uh, than usual, having kind of pressured speech where they're um, uh, speaking often fairly rapidly, like they have to get the words out. Um, and the related to that, uh, flight of ideas which this can be kind of subjectively where they kind of feel like their mind is racing or it can also be something that you can uh, uh, objectively uh, observe whenever they're uh, talking about this and they go to this thing and you know what else and I found this and hey I had another idea you know what else we could do and they're from one thing to the next so you know they can subjectively see that and then you can objectively observe it when they're uh, speaking to you you can see the, the flight of ideas not surprisingly then you would also have uh, potentially distractibility Right? looks a little like ADHD sometimes during a manic episode uh, where they have a hard time focusing uh, on something. Um, which, if you jump back in your mind for a second to a major depressive episode, you had uh, difficulty concentrating. Right? And so there's this kind of qualitative difference between that difficulty concentrating in depression and the distractibility of mania. So if uh, two people sitting together watching a movie uh, one has a one's in a depressed episode, one's in a manic episode. The one in a depressed episode, you know, trying to follow a plot, and there's a like, guy. I don't. Uh, what happened? I can't. I can't follow it. Right. And so they're having a hard time concentrating on what's going on, often because they're going into their own thoughts, uh, negative thought patterns, uh, and so having a hard time focusing on what's in front of them. Whereas the person with mania in front of them, like, oh yeah, I don't know what happened either, because I was looking at this guy next next to me eating popcorn, and that lady back there. You know, she kind of smells like cheese, and isn't that weird? And hey, that guy just walked in. So, one is about oh, I can't focus on this thing, and the other is I can't focus on anything because I'm focusing on everything. So they both have these impairments in kind of cognitive functioning, but they are qualitatively different. Uh, you also have to see this uh, potentially increase in goal-directed behavior, or you might see psychomotor agitation, which is more like uh, you. Increase in goal-directed behavior would be the things like. Um, you want to get something done and now you're going to do a lot of it. So oh, I think I should clean the house. And then you clean the whole house. Stay up all night and you clean every room and every drawer uh, and everything is super neat. Or um, I want to uh, um, buy some new things. And you go buy lots of new things. You go and get lots of things done. So you have high energy, lots of activity. And the psychomotor agitation is almost like we have that same thing pushing 
there's no clear goal and so you just get the kind of uh, fidgety um, psychomotor, ag psychomotor agitation where there's no goal to direct the behavior toward. Uh, and then another one that uh, kind of puts these people at risk is excessive involvement in high risk activities. Uh, so this could be um, you know, going out. I think it's time to try bungee jumping for the first time. Uh, I think I, you know, I think I can do, do this uh, street luge on uh, my uh, this my nephew's skateboard down the, this hill. Okay, that seems dangerous. No, it's fine. I'm gonna do it. Yay! And they go. Or it could be uh, indiscriminate uh, sexual relations. That's something that kind of happens. Uh, you have this kind of hyper uh, when you feel really good about yourself and you're not thinking about consequences. Uh, if you're an adult, one uh, high risk activity you could engage in is having sex with multiple partners. Um, and that tends to happen sometimes with uh, mainly becoming with this hypersexual behavior. So you just need three of those symptoms, or four more, four if you're irritable. And uh, for it to be a manic episode, it has to be severe enough to cause marked impairment, right? So if you're feeling really good and you're uh, kind of talkative and you don't need to sleep, uh, but you're not doing anything dangerous and you're not uh, going to get hospitalized, you're not going to get arrested, well, then it's technically not a manic episode. So uh, people who are super rich, less likely to get diagnosed with bipolar disorder because uh, they can get away with it. Sense of that. All right, very similar, hypomanic episode. Hypo meaning under, so just under mania. Again, you get a distinct period of abnormally and persistently elevated expansive or irritable mood and abnormally or persistently increased goal-directed activity energy. So same thing as mania, but this time, we have a shorter time frame we're looking at the required, uh, lasting at least four days, and again, present most of the time. So again, hypo meaning less, so you need less time uh, to be uh, meet criteria for this type of mood episode. So three or more mood symptoms, four if irritable, same things we just talked about for mania. So the same exact symptoms, just uh, you can have, um, you only need four days, you only need a week. Well, that seems weird. Well, what else? Well, because it's less time, we gotta make sure we, uh, you know, we're trying to draw this line below mania, but we don't want to put the bar too low to where now it's this kind of normal mood variation. So we throw back in. Well, the episode is an uncharacteristic and unequivocal change in functioning observable by others. Right. So it's not just yeah, you're a really happy person, um, and you uh, get really excited about things, and that's how you are. No, this is well. You, you seem something's different right now, right? And it's unequivocal change. So it's like I, maybe they seem a little happy. I'm not sure. Oh, definitely something's going on, and other people can observe it. So you kind of putting this uh, a ceiling on it. What's well, not many, but you're also putting a floor on it, saying, well, it's not also just being happy. But the really thing that distinguishes it from mania is the episode is not severe enough to cause marked impairment in functioning, right? So if you are kind of manic but it's not causing uh, those problems, you're not getting in trouble, not getting arrested, not getting hospitalized, well then it might be a hypomanic episode. Uh, and there, again, this is probably something that occurs on a continuum. Uh, as we'll see, frequently people that uh, experience uh, hypomanic episodes eventually will experience a meet criteria for a manic episode if left untreated. Not always, but fairly common. Uh, so it seems to be something on a continuum. But it may be important to know where somebody's at. Okay, they haven't been full manic yet, there's hypomanic. Okay, then we'll use this kind of uh, treatment approach versus that one. Okay, so we've identified the major mood episodes, depressive, manic, and hypomanic. So to meet criteria for major depressive disorder, obviously you need uh, currently or have a history of at least one major depressive episode. Meaning, you know, all those criteria we talked about for the episode, you know, five or more symptoms of da da da. Well, you got to be depressed or um, anhedonic. So, these mood symptoms cause clinically significant impairment or distress. Um, the mood symptoms aren't uh, caused by a drug or better explained by another disorder. So, here's where we get back to the other mood episodes. There's never been a manic or hypomanic episode. Right? So, you can't be diagnosed with major depressive disorder if at any time you've been manic or hypomanic. Once, you, once that happens, the diagnosis flips and becomes a bipolar disorder. Okay. And again, the thinking being that these are uh, neurologically, physiologically different phenomenon. 
okay, well, some people have these depressive symptoms, and um, if they don't ever have mania, then it's a different thing than if they do. If they do, okay, well, something else is going on, and they're, they're different. Maybe. We'll see. And then you tack on uh, specifiers, uh, quite a few of them, you know, the important ones. Uh, if it's a single episode, okay, these, which is the first time you've ever had a major depressive episode, or a recurrent episode, uh, which again, once you've had one major depressive episode, you're at increased risk for another one. It tends to have a chronic course. So you have a mood episode, and then with or without treatment, eventually that mood episode, um, you no longer meet criteria for it, so you return to uh, normal mood, or at least uh, sub-clinically uh, significant mood impairment, which, again, obviously you have a better outcome if you go from depression to normal mood, or even a little bit, little bit happy, that's could be a better predictor for you than people that go from depressed mood episode and then they don't quite get to normal mood. Well, okay, they no longer meet criteria for this episode, but they still have, a, they have enough symptoms that their mood's not normal. Okay, well, that's probably gonna be a, a, a tougher road uh, for those folks. So you specify if it's the first time or if it's recurrent episodes, specify the severity, um, and then whether or not they have psychotic features, um, now you can specify if um, they're in a full or partial remission of a mood episode. And then you can tack on the, uh, a variety uh, of other um, specifiers related to um, onset, um, if, the, uh, if you have those atypical features I talked about, where with a, one of the atypical features with a major depressive disorder would be if you have mood reactivity where you know you're depressed but then something good happens and you can laugh about it for a little bit. That doesn't typically happen, so it's atypical features. Uh, melancholic features, which harkens back to our old ideas of melancholia, um, which includes kind of a unique symptom pattern in terms of uh, the, uh, the, the change in symptoms uh, throughout the course of the day, uh, you know, when they're worse and when they're, uh, when they're better, um, and the patterns of those um, vegetative somatic symptoms being a little different. You specify there's a seasonal pattern, right? That's a kind of a seasonal affective disorder. So if you typically uh, get depressed in the winter, you would tackle on the seasonal um, specifier. Um, okay, a new disorder of the DSM is disruptive mood dysregulation disorder. And this is one that uh, was put in because, well, all the kids, all the teenagers were getting diagnosed with bipolar disorder. I like a lot of them. A ridiculous amount of them, right? So back in the um, 80s and the 90s, it was uh, ADHD, which is kind of the new diagnosis, and everybody got diagnosed with that. And then 90s into 2000s, into the 2010s, it became bipolar disorder. So kids that were acting out and causing parents uh, distress and grief, they go to doctors, they go to psychiatrists, they go to psychologists, and help me. And oftentimes the response is to apply a label. And for a while that label was ADHD, but it became bipolar disorder. One of the difficulties with the bipolar disorder label is uh, the drugs used to treat those are often some pretty heavy hitters. I uh, mean, lithium is, is no joke. Um, it's, uh, it's toxic at, uh, at high levels, which is why people have to go and get their, uh, the levels of lithium in their blood checked regularly when they're first starting, because too much it will kill you. Um, other drugs used often include anti-seizure medication, which, which have significant uh, side effects. So if you're misdiagnosing these kids with bipolar disorder, that's fairly potentially costly, right? Because they're experiencing lots of these uh, side effects when they don't need to be, because they don't really have that. And we think maybe they don't really have that because, you know, they followed these kids and found that, okay, yeah, they, they were irritable, right? Because with bipolar disorder, that's one of the things you could have is irritability but they never really looked manic in, in the other ways. They never got that grandiosity, that inflated sense of self-esteem. Um, they just seem kind of pissy all the time and angry and are mad. And ultimately, as they grew up, more likely to meet criteria for major depressive disorder, um, major depressive episodes, or uh, anxiety disorders. So it's like, okay, well, these are kids that are having some emotional problems early on that then go into anxiety, depression, that doesn't look like what we know about bipolar to be where you're gonna have these kind of recurrent episodes of mania across the lifespan. So they said, okay, well, let's put in this new uh, category to try to capture um, these mood problems that kids are having that doesn't seem to be a bipolar disorder. 
and it's lumped in now with the depressive disorders because the longer term outcome seems to be more experience of depressive symptoms than it does to um, manic symptoms. Okay, so it's uh, you know, getting angry. Severe recurrent temper outbursts that are grossly out of proportion in intensity or duration to the situation or provocation. So kids that lose their stuff, right? They get really angry and um, do it a lot. And this isn't just, um, mom, I hate you. Okay, that's not a severe outburst. It's, it's a bit more than that. And it also has to be inconsistent with developmental level, right? So if you've got a two-year-old throwing a tantrum, uh, banging on the floor, holding their breath uh, till they almost pass out, uh, that might be consistent with developmental level, depending on the family and the setting and all that. Now, if you're 20 and doing that, okay, that's a bit much, right? Or even if you're 16, but banging on your fist on the floor, throwing a tantrum, okay, that's uh, that's not developmentally consistent. Right? So you have to have some knowledge of what is developmentally consistent and what's developmentally consistent or developmentally appropriate. Well, that's going to depend on a lot of things, right? It's going to depend on uh, culture. It's going to depend on um, some socioeconomic things in terms of um, parents' education, child's education. It's going to depend on child's intelligence and their cognitive abilities. Uh, you know, not every 13-year-old is the same, right? They can be very different in terms of their development. So that's a, uh, that's a particularly difficult criteria to apply if you're going to do it well, uh, if you're going to be sensitive to um, variations in developmental trajectories. And again, this isn't just once in a while. This is uh, occurring three or more times a week. So almost every day, every other day, um, uh, these individuals are having these outbursts. And again, I say kids because that's kind of what the diagnostic category is created for. Um, could be applied to adults. Uh, it doesn't seem to be something that happens yet. Um, the mood between outbursts is irritable or angry most of the time. So really angry, throwing stuff, and then when they're not throwing stuff, still kind of pissy. Uh, you've got uh, at least a month, uh, sorry, at least a year uh, of these outbursts where there was never more than a three month period where it, it wasn't happening. So it's happening most of the time for a fairly long period of time. So this doesn't seem to be, let's stop for a second. Why would you put it at a year? And why not six months? Why not three months? Well, a couple reasons. One, if something happens, Right, uh, parents divorce, kid changes schools, things happen that are going to make a kid angry. It's kind of like, well, yeah, they're going to be angry for a while. But are they going to be angry for a year to where three times a week they're um, throwing a tantrum for a year for that one thing that happened a year ago? Probably not. Right. So you have that kind of fairly long period of time because, yeah, kids may get angry every day for a while, for a couple of months. Uh, if there's these kind of events going on or if they're going through kind of uh, those uh, pubertal uh, transitions that involve both hormonal shifts and shifts in relationships and social groups, all those things, it is a tumultuous time. So we have to be a little careful with these criteria. So you've got this fairly long period of time uh, required. Um, to suggest that this isn't just a reaction to um, some events that are going on or uh, a developmental phase where they're going through this time where they're kind of seeing they're pushing some boundaries and saying, what happens if I get angry? I get angry, do I, I win? Okay, I'm gonna do that for a while. Well, if they do it for a year, um, you know, maybe it's something else. Um, the outbursts, outbursts um, must be present in at least two of three settings and severe in at least one of these. So again, why do you have that criteria? Well, if it only happens at home with dad and they're fine with mom, they're fine at school, they're fine with their friends. They don't, uh, you know, they're in some organization, you know, uh, Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, whenever any authority there tells me something. Yeah, sure, I'll do it, no problem. Okay, wow, that's weird that they're throwing stuff at just you. Maybe it's not about the kid. Maybe it's about this relationship, right? So we need to see the symptoms in more than one setting to suggest that it is something more going on with the individual and not somebody else. That they're not just being a symptom of somebody else's pathology, perhaps. And then age of onset has to be before 10 years. So that doesn't mean that, uh, you know, somebody comes in and they're 12 
He says, all right, you, you should have come in two years ago. Can't diagnose you with this now. No, it's, if you, you can go back kind of historically, okay, when they were 10, 9, 8, 7, were they doing this? So based on historical report, you can still meet that criteria. Um, but again, the idea being that if they don't start doing this till they're 12, okay, maybe they're just being a teenager. Um, so trying to differentiate between the, the, um, the stormy emotionality of adolescence and kids that seem to really have, okay, something's different in how they're coping with uh, uh, emotional um, experiences. Because if that's there, if it's, if it's something that's more of a pathology, something that's maybe uh, gotten wired wrong or experientially, they're, they're not able to handle things, that's gotta be evident earlier, kind of before puberty. Because if you, if you don't have that criteria there where the, the onset before 10, then you're gonna diagnose every kid between 12 and you know, 17 probably. Um, there's never been a period lasting more than one day uh, where they were manic or hypomanic. So this is interesting, right? And I think you have to keep in mind when these criteria are written, they're written by committees based largely on scientific evidence they're still written by committees and people are voting. And you can kind of feel and you, know, you can read between the lines what's going on where there's these kind of trade-offs. Okay, we can put this in, but you got to put this in. So you've got people saying, well, we, we don't want to keep overdiagnosing these kids with bipolar disorder, so let's put it in this other other thing. So if they're, just, they're angry and they're irritable, it's not bipolar. It's this other thing. Right? And so that's what most of these criteria are. This one right here are those people that still want to diagnose kids with bipolar disorder. Where they, they really believe, no, if a kid is really irritable, uh, it probably is bipolar disorder. And so if they ever have two days where they're experiencing manic symptoms, you can no longer diagnose them with this disorder. Now, if they only experience two days, can you diagnose them with bipolar disorder? No, because they, they haven't had a manic episode yet. Manic episode requires four days. So the thinking here is, well, if it's more than a day, they're probably going to get four. And then we'll see that they're bipolar. Um, but it, it's interesting here that they put that uh, one day as the rule rather than um, rather than just saying, you know, they've never met criteria for a full manic or hypomanic episode. So, uh, manic being a week, hypomanic being four days. Um, so again, that's somebody on that committee who thinks that these angry kids are better seen as, uh, understood as having a bipolar disorder. So if, they're, if they can ever say, oh, well, yeah, for you know, these two days, they met criteria for a hypomanic episode. Okay, well then you don't get to use this label. I'm gonna wait and see if I can apply this other label. The behaviors um, don't only occur in the, the context of a major depressive episode. So if they're meeting criteria for a major depressive episode, you know, and they're irritable, and they're uh, not sleeping, and they're not eating, and they're um, having a hard time concentrating, they're thinking about suicide, and they're only having these angry outbursts during those episodes. So when they're, they don't meet full criteria for an episode, they come that have that mood recovery. If during that mood recovery, they're not having outbursts anymore, well then it's not disruptive mood dysregulation disorder, it's just major depressive, depressive episode. If they have the outbursts during an episode, once they have the mood recovery, they're no longer feeling quite quite as depressed. You know, they can be happy. Maybe they're sleeping okay, but they're still having the outburst. Okay, then you can have both. So you can have both major depressive disorder and disruptive mood dysregulation disorder. You can't have um, bipolar disorder and disruptive mood dysregulation disorder uh, at the same time, but you can have, uh, uh, obviously, you, you could have major depressive disorder. Um, but you wouldn't add the disruptive mood if the outburst were only when you were really depressed. But if you're still having the outburst when you're not really depressed, Okay, then you should get this. So I said you can't can't be diagnosed comorbid with uh, bipolar disorder. We already said, also can't be diagnosed comorbid with oppositional defiant disorder, or intermittent explosive disorder. Which again, these these committees that work saying, well, where you don't tack on both these labels because now you're labeling the same thing. You've got to figure out which one you think it is. So if a kid is being oppositional and saying no to authority all the time, is it really about having a hard time complying with authority, or is it because they're angry and have a hard time controlling their emotions. 
uh, and the intermittent explosive disorder, again, okay, is this uh, um, an impulse control disorder or is it more about the mood? Um, which I'll be real curious to see how that, that plays out over time with research, trying to differentiate between people uh, in those two categories because that doesn't seem to me to be um, well-defined boundaries. Okay, now into persistent depressive disorder. Uh, again, DSM loves to change names of things. Uh, this is commonly called dysthymia or dysthymic disorder. This is where you have depressed mood most of the time for a period of at least two years. So this is kind of like the, the, the Eeyore disorder, right? Where you have this almost like personal, personal logic uh, depression, where somebody's characteristically just depressed most of the time and has been for a long time kind of a down, depressed uh, mood. And actually this um, in DSM-5, uh, this new diagnostic ca category combines dysthymia, uh, which is just kind of that personality depression, with um, chronic depression, where you have recurrent uh, major depressive episodes. Um, so during this time, during those two years, uh, you have two or more of the following symptoms either a poor appetite or overeating. So again, some of the same stuff I see with a uh, major depressive episode, insomnia or hypersomnia, low energy, poor concentration, and feelings of hopelessness. So you'll notice some things missing from that list, right? So there's some overlap with a major depressive episode, but you don't see um, suicidal ideation or kind of those recurrent thoughts of death. Uh, that seems to be more characteristic of uh, kind of a deeper, more profound level of depression associated with a major depressive episode. So this is more of that um, thing about that line between normal mood fluctuations of sadness, I'm feeling kind of low, on in one one area of the, the continuum, a major depressive episode being on the far end. This is kind of in between the two, right? So uh, less pronounced mood symptoms, but for a long period of time. And in fact, during the the, the two year period. Uh, never been without symptoms for more than two months. Okay, so notably, there's, there can be no history of a manic hypomanic episode or cyclothymia. Right, because if you're ever uh, manic, when you have bipolar disorder, uh, if you're ever um, hypomanic, okay, then it's not necessarily bipolar disorder, but maybe cyclothymia. We'll just talk about cyclothymia in a minute. Um, Think about depression and bipolar disorders being two different things, right? Depression is really depressed. Bipolar disorders, where you have an alternating between mania and depression. So long-term depression is dysthymia, or persistent depressed disorder. Long-term bipolar disorder, we'll see in a bit, is cyclothymia. So it's not that. So you're not um, feeling sad and then a little happy. Sad's a little happy. It's just kind of sad all the time. And again, not uh, better accounted for by another disorder or caused by um, you know, some drug. Uh, it has clinically significant, um, causes clinically significant distress or impairment. Uh, and then you specify, and you can tack on the same specifiers we've seen with other mood disorders, but then you, um, somewhat unique to this one, you should specify uh, the onset if it's early or late. Before age 21 would be early onset. After one would be late onset. So. And early being more of the normal, normative thing, where most people that diagnose with this disorder seems to be that what's well, how I've been, at least for the old school dysthymia. For chronic depression, it may be a little different. Um, and then you also uh, obviously specify the uh, presence and frequency of major depressive episodes. <coughs> so. You can be diagnosed with both major depressive disorder and persistent depressive disorder. If you have meet criteria for a major depressive episode, then you're going to meet criteria for major depressive disorder. If you get these kind of chronic symptoms, it's a two-year period of uh, symptoms for a long time, where you, is where you'd, you'd only have that inner episode recovery, then you get tacked on with this as well, and that's often referred to uh, colloquially, colloquially as double depression. Uh, one of the more controversial disorders in the DSM, 
premenstrual dysphoric disorder. Uh, so obviously uh, diagnosed only in women. One reason it's controversial. Uh, and this is where in the majority of menstrual cycles, at least five symptoms in the final week before menses, uh, which then start to improve after the onset of menses and then become minimal uh, or absent in the week post menses. So you've got these mood symptoms, really pronounced mood symptoms, right before menstruation. They start to get better during and then they go away. So as soon as you related to the, uh, the menstrual cycle, and you have to have uh, one or more of the following. So marked affective lability, which affective lability is uh, mood change, so mood swings, uh, something happens and mood ch changes uh, quickly and then changes back to something else. That would be a labile mood, uh, marked ir irritability or anger, marked depressed mood, or marked anxiety or tension. So you have to have at least uh, one of those, and you have to have at least one uh, of these. Decreased interest in usual activities, subjective difficulty in concentration, lethargy, a change in appetite, hypersomnia, insomnia, sense of being overwhelmed, or physical symptoms like breast tenderness, a feeling of bloating. Um, so between these two groups of symptoms, you've got to have five total, and at least one from each group. interesting the the first grouping being really about kind of a, a, a moodiness right affective ability irritability uh, depression or anxiety and the second for the most part being more your classic symptoms of depression right where you've got the concentration the lethargy uh, the, some, the vegetative symptoms of appetite insomnia uh, but then they throw in the physical symptoms um, which seem to be more related to um, not as not, not as tied to depression so it's interesting. So again, uh, if it's happening, it's not a disorder unless it causes clinically significant stress or impairment. Um, and again, these symptoms aren't better explained by uh, another disorder. And for diagnosis, you need data from at least two cycles where you're kind of prospectively uh, charting uh, mood and these symptoms. Okay, yep, here's, I was fine. And then had, I started having symptoms. And then a couple days later, uh, began my cycle. And then they got better and then uh, after the end of the cycle the mood symptoms went away you've got to track at least two of those cycles um, to be diagnosed so why is it controversial well on one, one side you may be um, simply pathologizing um, what is a typical biological function uh, among women right where you have uh, these hormonal shifts that are gonna um, cause shifts in psychological functioning because Psychological functioning is determined by hormones and neurotransmission, all that stuff. So, yeah, there are going to be these changes. And if you are labeling it with a label that goes in this book, this DSM, then you're saying it's pathology, it's illness. And that could be used, uh, obviously, once you label somebody as being ill, in some cases, that puts them at risk for being discriminated against, having certain rights uh, taken away. Uh, well, we can't trust you with this. You can't, uh, you know... Uh, get a gun permit or drive you've got this disorder it may not be safe for you uh, you're sick right so that's one side of the argument uh, another side would be well s some women and it's a small percentage of women that um, experience um, um, premenstrual distress you know a fair number of women have um, you know hormonal shifts related to changes in mood uh, and irritability and some physical symptoms but even of those women, which is uh, not, not all of them, of those, it's a smaller subset that meets these criteria. And the argument is that there does seem to be this subset of a population that experiences uh, symptoms that are clinically significant and therefore would benefit from treatment. Uh, and just saying, oh, well, it's normal. Well, it may not be um, normal if it's so statistically rare. It may represent some sort of um, uh, dysfunction uh, disruption some it's on some sim, sim, system sorry um, that would require uh, intervention and they would benefit from and if you don't give them the label it's harder to give them the treatment the debate continues okay uh, bipolar one uh, presence or history of at least one manic episode okay that's it right. so uh, the manic episode is not accounted for uh, or better explained by so you're not high on coke or amphetamines, and uh, it's not better explained by um, another disorder. 
So if you uh, are thinking that you are the the son of God, well, it's not psychosis, it's mania. So you have to determine that the symptoms are better explained by something else. Um, that's about it. And then you specify you know, the most recent episode, uh, if it was manic, hypomanic, or depressive, because you can have any of those in bipolar one. Specify the uh, severity, uh, if it's in partial form remission, and then the, the features we've talked about before, you know, if you have that um, melancholic features, atypical features we've talked about before, um, a seasonal pattern. Um, one that's unique to bipolar, that, uh, specify that doesn't get tacked onto depressive disorder is rapid cycling. So I have bipolar disorder with rapid cycling. This is, I think, a, a specifier that's misunderstood by the general public. So they think of, oh, oh yeah, they're, they're, uh, they're bipolar and they're a rapid cycler. So that means like, you know, they came in today and they were manic uh, at breakfast. And after lunch, they were totally depressed. And the next morning they were manic again. And then, the, and then at night they were depressed again. Not that rapid, right? So to get the specifier of rapid cycling, you have to have a certain number of distinct mood episodes in a year. And not manic episodes, but distinct mood. So manic to depressed, or manic to hypomanic. So how many mood episodes do you need to have in a 12 month period to be rapid cycling? I think a lot of people think, well, it's not, not every day, so you know, probably, you know, just once a month, you know, so it's probably 12 a year. No, it's not, it's four. Four episodes a year is a rapid cycling, right? Because you don't typically leave an episode that quick. And, Diagnostically, you can't stop having an episode in one day and it'd be an episode, right? You have to have, for a manic episode, it has to be a full week. For a depressive episode, it has to be two weeks. Have a manic, it's got to be four days. And typically, they're longer than that, especially depressive episodes. Um, so even if you're going to be shifting from one mood episode to the next, if you're going to meet criteria for a full mood episode, it's going to take some time. So they don't seem to be up, down, up, down, day in, day out. It's longer than that, even if they are a rapid cycler. Now, that being said, there is a specifier uh, of um, that you can add to the mood disorders with mixed features. And this is when uh, you have, uh, during a manic episode, you also have some depressive symptoms. Or during a depressive episode, you also have some manic symptoms. So um, mostly depressed and down, but also surprise some irritability, and then maybe a little bit of um, occasional flight of ideas. Well, that's kind of strange. Or where you're mostly manic, but then have some suicidal ideation while manic. And again, it's not uh, super common, but it does happen for a small group of people where you do see this mix. Uh, and that's probably more what people are thinking about when they think of rapid cyclers, where they're up and down. Well, that's because they're having this mixed episode, uh, or mixed features, we call it now. Uh, where you get a little bit of each one at the same time. Uh, and I think that's probably one of the, the least understood groups of people right now. Um, okay. Okay, so uh, bipolar 2 disorder. How is it different from bipolar 1? Bipolar 1, you have to have a manic episode. Bipolar 2, currently or history of a hypomanic episode. So not manic, but hypomanic. But then you also have to have a currently or history of a major depressive episode. So for bipolar one, do you need to have a major depressive episode? No, not at all. For once you have a manic episode, you get you can get the label of bipolar one. That's all that's required. Frequently most people do experience depressive episodes. They don't have to. They could be um, manic and then hypomanic, normal, and then back to manic, back to hypomanic, back to normal. Typically they do dip below normal and get, uh, if not all the way to a depressive episode, less than normal mood. They have some depressive symptoms. Most frequently though, they do eventually have at least one uh, dep depressed episode in there, but it's not required for diagnosis. All that's required for diagnosis is a manic uh, episode because it's kind of the key feature of bipolar one. Now for bipolar two, you don't get that key feature. So if you don't have that key feature, you're just hypomanic, you're not quite there yet, well, then we're not ready to give you a diagnosis unless you've also have previously had or currently are having a major depressive episode. So, uh, to me, for bipolar 2, you can't have ever had a manic episode. Right? So if you're currently hypomanic, 
you've previously been depressed, and then four years ago you met criteria for a manic episode. Well, just because you're hypomanic now doesn't mean you're bipolar two. You're still bipolar one because you were diagnosed with that manic episode a long, long time ago. Right. So what happens if you're diagnosed, uh, or if you meet criteria? So not, not diagnosed. If you meet criteria for a hypomanic episode currently, and you have no history of a major depressive episode and no history of a manic episode. Uh, well, you're not gonna meet criteria for any of the disorders we've talked about. It's not bipolar two, not bipolar one, not a uh, major depressive disorder. Might meet criteria um, for a disorder we'll talk about in a minute, but um, hypomania by itself, um, usually they'll think, okay, let's keep an eye on you. Eventually you're gonna be manic. But if not, okay, you just felt really good for a little bit of time. That was weird. Uh, but again, for bipolar 2, you have to have hypomania and depression. Not at the same time, but in, in, over your lifetime. And the mood symptoms cause clues of symptom impairment and, of course, um, aren't uh, better explained by a drug or some other um, disorder. Okay, so the other disorder uh, I said we, we talked about, we just referenced. Cyclothymic disorder, cyclothymia. Two years of numerous periods with hypomanic symptoms without a hypomanic episode and numerous depressive symptoms without a major depressive episode. So if you're almost hypomanic, but not quite, and never fully manic, never depressed, you can meet criteria for cyclothymic. Now, if you are in that weird place where you meet criteria for a hypomanic episode, but not any other mood episode, you get no diagnosis. But if you're not quite hypomanic, but you also alternate with some not quite de major depressive episode, so a uh, little manic, little depressed, little manic, little depressed over time, you know, so kind of like with this thymic disorder, or persistent depressive disorder, you've got this long period of two years, that one always down, this one up, down, up, down, then that would be cyclothymic disorder. So to meet criteria for this disorder, the mood symptoms must have been present for at least half the time uh, during that period and never absent for more than two months. Uh, and again, you can't have ever met criteria for any of the mood episodes, manic, hypermanic, or major depressive. Uh, if you meet criteria for manic, regardless of what else you have, it's bipolar one. If you meet criteria for hypo hypomanic, it's maybe bipolar two, maybe nothing. Depends on if you have a major depressive episode. If you meet criteria for major depressive, depressive episode, could be any of the, the big three. Could be major depressive disorder, if that's the only type of mood episode you had. Could be bipolar one, if you've also been manic. Or it could be bipolar two, if you've also been hypomanic. And again, like most things, uh, the mood symptoms are not caused by you know, a drug, not a condition, or better explained by another disorder. And they cause clinically significant distress or impairment in multiple areas mm -hmm. of function. Okay, take home. The mood episodes, they are episodes. They have a beginning and an end, right? For the most part. And this is why uh, we really need to distinguish between mood episodes and what we see with like uh, cyclothymia and dysthymia, where you're just kind of chronically depressed mood or chronically alternating fluctuations of mood. Those are these kind of uh, personality like uh, disorders. Whereas people with major depressive disorder, bipolar one and two, there are these distinct periods of time where their mood shifts, shifts down or shifts up. And those shifts tend to be disproportionate to what's going on, right? So if you know life is kind of shitty for a while and you're feeling kind of sad, well, then that's appropriate. Your, your, your mind and your body are responding appropriately. Now, if it becomes too much, you know, life is shitty, but you're really sad and you're thinking about killing yourself, okay, that may be a major depressive episode because it begins to become disproportionate to what's happening. Who decides if it's disproportionate? Well, somebody with a license that's imbued by the power of a state to say that you meet criteria for a disorder. The, the mood states, depression, seems to be about, again, low energy. So not necessarily just sadness, but just kind of absence of positive affect, feeling really low, not uh, able to find joy or happiness. And mania being on the flip of that, this kind of high energy. Uh, and again, high energy, if you get the good mania, it's with the happiness, but it isn't necessarily. It could be high energy with irritability. Like lots of energy, ah, uh, yay, or lots of energy, ah, uh, angry, right? Uh, either way, these things seem to be um, 
opposite ends of the, the energy spectrum, which makes you know the bipolar disorders so interesting because you can experience both of these things. So which mood disorder uh, you meet criteria for, again, depends on which episodes uh, you've experienced in the past and or are currently experiencing. Uh, mania is kind of the trump card thing that flips whatever your diagnosis is, because your diagnoses can change, right? Somebody that, uh, you know, they're 29, let's say, uh, and they have their first major depressive episode, uh, and they have a major depressive episode, and they're uh, diagnosed with major depressive disorder. If a year later they have a manic episode, which would be a little late, typically first manic episode is going to be before, before 30, um, but if they do, okay, now they no longer meet criteria for major depressive disorder, that diagnosis goes away, and they now meet criteria for bipolar 1. If instead they had a hypomanic episode, okay, they get bipolar 2, and major depressive disorder goes away. Um, so uh, mania and hypomania can kind of get rid of the depressive diagnosis. But if they had uh, a hypomanic episode, okay, depressive disorder goes away, now it's bipolar 2. But then if at some, any point in the future, a manic episode uh, um, presents, okay, well now that mania trumps them both, Bipolar 2 goes away, and it's bipolar 1, which makes, uh, you know, obviously researching these populations difficult because you may have people then in, your, in your study that you think have major depressive disorder, but really they have bipolar disorder, they just haven't been manic yet, or uh, bipolar 2, or whichever one it is. Um, so, We'll talk more next time about uh, prevalence, about causes, about treatment, and then we'll talk, spend a little time talking about um, one of the kind of more serious outcomes, potential outcomes of mood disorders, particularly for bipolar disorder, that being uh, suicide. Until then, take care.